Well, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. My name is Oscar Medina. I'm the assistant director of the Tucson Center here. I wanted to also um, introduce uh, a few folks. Um, but before, I uh, just want to welcome everybody to our first um, discussion, our first workshop series, uh, one of three that is going to be taking place this fall. Um, when we were planning these uh, workshops and these panels, we we were planning on having them in person, but uh, because of, of the ongoing pandemic, uh, they will remain virtually. Um, so to, tonight, uh, it's really a, an honor and a privilege uh, to be moderating uh, this panel. Um, I'm, I'm an associate faculty member for Prescott College. I teach in the social justice and community organizing program. Um, and um, it's really, um, really a privilege to start off today's uh, panel by, by doing a land acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge that this gathering is taking place throughout uh, the unceded territories of what is now referred to as the United States original home to hundreds of sovereign tribal nations. As we begin, we acknowledge and honor the original people of various regions. A land acknowledgement is a critical step towards working with native communities to secure meaningful partnerships and inclusion in the stewardship and protection of their cultural resources and homelands. Let us take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that we are collectively gathered upon and support the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have shown worldwide. I'm currently speaking and uh, speaking from Tucson, Arizona, which is the unceded territories of the Tohono O'odham and Yoeme people. I wanna invite you to share and, and drop in the chat box uh, where you are logging in from today. Thank you. Well, tonight's um, tonight's conversation is is really about the the shifting that we're seeing in in education. Right, we're going to be um, having the privilege of listening to educators and students um, who are challenging the traditional schooling system. And we'll also um, you know, be able to share and discuss tonight some of the ongoing work that's happening around decolonial education, um, some of the, the practices and practices that uh, folks are employing. Um, and uh, I'm gonna start off by introducing uh, our, first, our first panelist, Jasmine Angulo is an environmental and education advocate. She's an alumni at Changemaker High School who, to, who took part in several youth empowerment programs and worked with several youth organizations. She served as an AmeriCorps member on the Changemaker campus in 2019. She was certified to be a facilitator for a youth empowerment program. Jasmine has presented at national and international conferences. Jasmine is in her second year at the University of Arizona, pursuing her degree in math education. Um, raised in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Tyrell Blackamas is a prophetic dream worker and descendant of a long line of African priests and Turtle Island missing people. He founded Dream School and is expanding Dream School into a K-20 Afro-Indigenous school 
sustenance learning farm, teaching birth center, and clinic. As a scholar researcher with a bachelor's of fine arts with an emphasis in Africana studies and indigenous studies from Cornell University, Black and Moss reclaims and continues their family legacy of the science and art of dreaming. Black and Moss has traveled globally studying with shamans, elders, and healers in many traditions. They were in 2019, um, fellow of uh, Freedom Schools, National Health Candidate at Prescott College in Social and Environmental Arts Practice with Patrice uh, Cullers. Black and Moss is the Sustainability Manager and Healing Artist in Residence at Southern Arizona Gender Alliance and a Green Business Leader. Lastly, we have Dr. Anita Fernandez, she is the Chief Diversity Officer at Prescott College and Director of the Tucson Center. She is the Co-Founder and Director of the Chicanex Institute for Teaching and Organizing. She has several years of experience as an educator and is currently teaching a course called Decolonial Pedagogy out of the Tucson Center on the K-20 Changemaker campus. Welcome everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to start off by, by framing the problem. Um, and, and the way we want to talk about this is, is looking at what our educational experiences have been like um, in, in the traditional K-12 uh, schooling system. So if you can, um, if you can share and, and join us, um, if you can turn your camera on, and I'm going to stop sharing this. And J Jasmine, if you can jump in first, what was your experience within the traditional K-12 uh, schooling system? Um, okay, well, so I guess I was I was made aware of the t of the model of a banking education system um, in my senior year of high school, where um, we're talking about how students are just seen as vessels, where teachers just put knowledge into them, and there's no conversation in the classroom. I feel like that was essentially what my K through eight um, high school, like my school experience was. And then when I went to high school, I was able to experience more of a, of communication, open dialogue in my, in my classroom. So I guess that was nice being humanized in the, in the classroom. But I guess my, it wasn't the best experience I would say um, growing up, but then I was able to experience something better in high school. But um, you do get that, that open dialogue in college, but it's, it's nice to have been exposed to that before then. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, Tyrell, would you like to jump in? Mm -hmm. um, so I grew up in Wisconsin, <clears throat> which in 2014, they put out a report, the Annie Casey Foundation put out a report that Wisconsin ranked as the lowest state in the whole country for the educational resources for Black children. And so essentially, I was raised in the worst state to raise Black children. Um, so what that looked like in my educational experience was that I was pulled out of the elementary school in my neighborhood and I was bused to a, an elementary school on the other side of town. So I was seven years old and I had to ride the bus for an hour every morning to get to school. And so I was taken to the school with mostly white children. And at that age, it meant that I wasn't being affirmed in my cultural practices. I had to change the way that I spoke to fit in with the students, the white students up from the other side of town. Um, and also it meant that the my teachers were making a lot of assumptions about my abilities, about how intelligent or unintelligent I was. In third grade, I had teachers tell me that I wasn't going to get into college because I wasn't practicing my viola enough. Um, and the study also shows that Wisconsin and ranks 10th overall for white students. So it's not that it's a poor education system in Wisconsin, but that it is, it treats black children very, very unfairly. And so as I came up through school, um, different 
So when I was in high school, Harvard called my parents' house to ask if I needed any support applying to school. I eventually did get into Cornell University. I was one of two students in my entire high school to get into an Ivy League. So it's clear that I was a very gifted and talented student, um, but the, the teachers, the educators, they were not supportive. And so I am someone who, I'm not saying that I'm an exception to what goes on in Wisconsin. I'm saying that I'm highly exceptional and was able to get into a really into a really prestigious college, but at the same time, my mental health um, suffered very, very greatly. When I was 12 years old, when I had my first mental health breakdown, 17 when I had my second, and it took me eight years to finish college. So it has definitely been <clears throat> a lifelong struggle to heal from the experiences of growing up and being Black in Wisconsin. Thank you, Tyrell. Anita? Yes, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I just want to say how excited I am to be here, particularly with sharing the panel with Jasmine and Tyrell. Um, and I think the three of us represent, you know, not only different positionalities, but also different generations and different um, coming at this work from different um, times and spaces, right? And so, and Oscar for hosting, also for moderating. But um, so I did not attend U.S. schools until I did not, I wasn't in the U.S. until secondary school. And so I had a very limited experience um, in traditional schools. Um, so I'll share a little bit of that, but I think I'll share more, uh, you know, as a public high school teacher, as an English teacher in Tucson, what I saw um, was the impact uh, on the youth. Um, definitely in high school saw, you know, uh, as teacher, as a teacher, a lot of deficit ideologies being um, really impacting the youth and it, specifically ideologies about what students were able to attain or not, you know, sort of uh, piggybacking off what Tyrell referred to and expectations of our youth, particularly BIPOC youth. And even from with school counselors um, actually encouraging students not to take certain courses or certain electives and funneling them into uh, courses that weren't necessarily for a quote unquote college track or um, you know weren't voc ed in the, in the high school where I was teaching. And so uh, I, I was an English teacher and also um, was the advisor for the, the school newspaper. And I would have set students all the time, Chicano students who would say, you know, miss, I wanna really join the newspaper and would tell me that the, their advisor would say, no, 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 you know, you'd probably be happier in this elective or in that elective. And it was always an elective that was tied to um, you know, more of a, a vocational ed um, field. And even if they were not interested in that at all, they would really get pushed into those spaces. Um, I also, definitely saw a lot of teachers who wanted to indoctrinate children in, um, you know, this very nationalistic sorts of views about US history and about um, not wanting to, to see themselves as in any way having an opinion about things and, and wanting to remain quote unquote neutral. And, and a lot of teachers that honestly just didn't like kids um, and that oftentimes wondered why they were teaching in schools and why they're working with children because it was really clear that it was more about their own power rather than about really wanting to engage with young people in a way that would help provide opportunities for them to develop their you know sense of self and um and an impact you know in the larger community thank you thank you for opening it up um this next question and this question is for for anyone who wants to jump in uh any one of the panelists it's more centered on BIPOC students. What specific issues do you think most impact BIPOC and low-income students in, in traditional K-12 schools? Specifically, what do you think uh, pushes students out of school? Okay, um, I guess. The lack of resources would include like tutors because I, I guess a lot of 
where a lot of people like I didn't go I went to change maker so I had I had access to tutors thank god but I know a lot of um other schools they have not the best tutors or they don't have access to tutors or counseling or after school programs um or any type of sense of community because they're so um I don't know, I feel like schools right now are very cutthroat in the sense of like, nobody cares about each other. It's more, I need to get into a university. And so like a lot of people don't sit back and like just humanize each other. And I think that um, the lack of humanizing and the lack of like resources in those, in those schools kind of push people away from each other. And it's more of just like, I need to get this work done so I can get into a school or just graduate. And a lot of people don't even have the, the mentality of going to college, just simply graduating, getting out of school. Um, but also the disciplinary actions taken in schools, um, especially in lower income communities and, be, and by POC would um, like the detention or the expulsion or the lack, lack of counseling or not, no restorative justice in the schools is what really, I think, pushes students out because they don't really feel like they belong there. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning a lot of good points. Thank you. Jasmine, I want to uh, add to what you were saying about students feeling like they don't belong there. I think when I look at my K through 12 experience and then also what I am building now, I really think about schools as not acknowledging ancestral grief that many, like from, in particular, African Americans who are descended from enslaved Africans, like that's a, that's a whole lot of grief that the kids are experiencing, you know, when, when they're born, you know, the things that their parents are experiencing, the things that their grandparents have experienced, and then the ways that that history is taught in school can be very, very inappropriate. It can be very, very re-traumatizing. I know for myself in particular that I learned about the Middle Passage and I learned about what slavery was like through an activity where me as the only black student in class was told to be to sit under a desk and we were supposed to imagine what it was like to be crowded in a ship um, in the middle, middle passage and that was how we were taught about slavery and so I think that in the curriculum building it is not there is not an acknowledgement of this ancestral grief is not an acknowledgement of the ways that things that happened in history have a an interpersonal, a personal, a political, a systemic impact on the students who are being taught those histories. And so to teach those histories, you really have to have some capacity and some compassion about how you're teaching those histories. I also recently saw um, an exhibit here in Tucson that was claiming that we, we are all immigrants, which sounds a little bit like we all chose to come here. And they even specify that indigenous people of this land came here from Asia at some point. Um, and that it really doesn't acknowledge that you know, people were killed, <laughs> people were killed, they experienced cultural genocide and it's, also is not acknowledging the ancestral grief and the ways that that ancestral grief shows up in kids acting out, shows up in what they are diagnosed with, shows up in uh, the, the term that keeps getting thrown around, the, the deficits term, deficit thinking. All of that shows up in the ways that colonization played out and the ways that we haven't been given space to heal that ancestral grief and heal the impacts of colonization, of slavery, of cultural genocide. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for, for mentioning. Anita, did you want to jump in? I just wanted to, um, I really appreciate that response, Tyrell, and just made me think about, um, you know, one of the big push outs tied to that trauma is, you know, that healing, healing centered piece. Um, and, and the lack of uh, students having or teachers building relationships with their students and really understanding who they are and where they're coming from and really building classes and schools around a pedagogy of love and a pedagogy of care um, 
as one of the core tenets, right, of a decolonial pedagogy, as well as having teachers that are steeped in, you know, understanding the impacts of settler colonialism, of racism, of power differentials, but then also understanding how to, as Tyrell's saying, you know, how to actually engage in decolonial pedagogy. And we don't have very many teacher preparation programs that prepare teachers for that. And so we have a lot of status quo that ends up in, in pushing students out. Um, and we need teachers that can, that are not only committed, but have the skills and the knowledge to, you know, build a better future, um, to imagine what's possible. You know, I think um, what I've heard from Tyrell's work uh, specifically is really reimagining, right? A lot of that reimagining piece of what school spaces could be and, and should be. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, we're, we're now at the, at the transitioning point, right? And we're gonna, we're gonna get into some of the, the projects and some of the work that people are doing and some of the framing the future, right? Framing like, how do we, how do we get out of a dehumanizing uh, traditional educational system that, that is uh, harming uh, a lot of our students? And so the next question is, um, what can educators and students do to, to revolutionize, to change and decolonize education? If you're, um, if you can currently, if you can talk about some of the projects that you're involved with and you can share a little bit about it, I, I would appreciate it. Um, yeah, so right now um, I'm working with this amazing organization called IMU360 and we um, do hygiene bags um, specifically made for um, certain types of hair textures different so it really just it's not like just a regular bag of like you know hotel type of quality um, shampoo and conditioner given to uh, somebody with I don't know like you can't give hotel quality um, shampoo and conditioner to a black women because she doesn't have the hair for that and then also like with Latino women when they have curlier hair we give them um products made for curly hair rather than kinkier hair and stuff like that so um we're, we're more into like um giving something to, some, to somebody that so that they feel like they deserve it because we do focus on hygiene a lot because it's really powerful to walk into a room knowing that you feel you smell good you look good and that you can talk to anybody and just feel confident talking to them um, but within that group, that, that within that program, we do um, an empowerment program that I teach that teaches all around um, self-awareness and um, looking at the world in a different way. And I think um, I would love to see that type of program put into classrooms because I feel like if you don't know who you are, you can't really interact with the world in a positive way. Um, and so pushing to see um, for students who really care for themselves and then pushing for them to see the world in a more in a lens that doesn't see the world as ugly as it can be and just being able to love others. And um, I think through that, that pro this program that I help teach, um, it's helped me really engage with a lot of people from different walks of life. And um, I think something like that in a, in a school would really help. Um, I tried before, but it's, it's a little challenging to get that type of curriculum inside of, of schools. I've gotten a lot of pushback, but um, we're still working on it. Thank you, Jasmine. Jasmine, I've seen um, the I am 360 work on Instagram. It's very, very powerful. If you want to maybe put the Instagram in the chat so everyone can be. Yeah, familiar. I'm going to go ahead and do that. It's amazing. I love it. We're doing um, right now. We're housing um, homeless youth that were pushed out of the foster system. And we've just housed, I think, about nine to 10 youth. And we're um, pushing them like to do. Um, classes for financial responsibility and literacy and so it's super cool because we just want to get them back into the world and so that they can actually go out and do stuff with their communities so yeah I'll, I'll drop the Instagram thank you Tyrell do you want to address the the question mm -hmm. um so I think that students what they can do is to tell adults tell your teachers your parents after school Whoever, tell adults like what you're experiencing in school and be as clear as you can to let them know when something is hurting you or when you feel really encouraged by something that another adult is doing. And I think for the educators, um, kind of like Anita said about some 
people, some educators don't even like children. Um, and for the educators who decide that, that this is where they want to be and they do like children to learn, and that, that may look like taking classes or doing workshops around listening for how students are in pain and who are unable to articulate it with words, and maybe they're doing it with their body language, or maybe they're doing it with rolling their eyes and you're interpreting it as an attitude, but what they really is are experiencing is pain and there needs to be some adjustment so that they're no longer in pain. And for educators to really remember that we're living in a post-colonial society, meaning that the earth and all of us are very, very gravely ill. Like we're ill as a society, we're ill emotionally, like transphobia, racism, homophobia, all of those things are symptoms of a larger illness. So it's really important for educators to do their own healing work and to kind of figure out how do you forgive the educators who harmed you in your past? How do you forgive your parents? Because if you don't do that forgiveness work, you're likely bringing that into the classroom and you are likely taking it out on the students who are in front of you who haven't done anything to you. They're just trying to figure out how to navigate this really complicated system that they were born into. And so my program called Dream School what we are doing in dream school is we're creating a safe place for students to dream. We primarily work with adults. And so educators, if you're on here and you would like to find out more information about what dream school classes look like for adults, it's a lot of deep diving into yourself to figure out some of your ancestral dream traditions because we're working with the dreams, we're working with the subconscious and we're working with the things about oneself that we may like push down and don't want to look at and we're bringing it to the light so that you know so that we can be better humans so that we can be kinder to ourselves and to the people around us and so we are an oral history project meaning that we really activate the stories that our families tell over kitchen tables we activate like how do when we tell each other our dreams, like what happens to those dreams, what allows those dreams to become because we're sharing it with someone and then someone's able to connect us to a level of support. Uh, we also are an alternative to the school to prison pipeline because we are, we're, we're really moving from a decolonial Afro-Indigenous holistic, you know, we teach herbalism, we teach watching the moon, we teach going outside to ground yourself. We're moving from a very holistic, um, a very holistic framework. And as Jasmine said, it's not about competition. Like everybody has a wealth of cultural knowledge and what we're doing is reflecting back to you so that you can figure out what is your wealth of cultural knowledge and like, why did you decide to come, you know, to earth this time? Like, what's your assignment? What did you come here to do? Are you supposed to be singing? Are you supposed to be a writer? Are you supposed to be a firefighter? What are you supposed to be doing? And if you're, what you're doing is super far off and you're not happy, you're not going to be a happy contributing member of community. So teaching people how to be in community again through listening to our dreams and listening to the dreams of our ancestors. That's wonderful. Thank you. Anita, would you like to add? Sure, I'll just share briefly about um, the project I'm involved in uh, in terms of decolonizing pedagogy other than my teaching at Prescott College, uh, which would be Shito, the Chicanx Institute for Teaching and Organizing. And so we are a grassroots urban education collective um, and we train educators and organizers and administrators and counselors in a decolonizing pedagogy, um, building off of uh, what is now the outlawed former Mexican American studies program. And so continuing on that legacy and building and growing it into something new. And so currently um, we've trained thousands of teachers across the country um, in this pedagogy. And we are right now, you know, facing a new front as we can call it, and, um, that is very, similar to the front that we were facing back in 2010 in Tucson in terms of fighting for uh, the right to teach about our histories and our cultura and having a decolonizing pedagogy within our school system um, that's happening right now in California mostly I mean, it's happening nationally this pushback on critical race theory but also on a decolonizing ethnic studies curriculum so we um, the original 
ethnic studies curriculum that was developed by scholars, uh, many of whom are, uh, you know, colegas and friends of ours uh, and part of the Shito Collective, um, that curriculum was eliminated because of the inclusion of Arab American studies and specifically Palestine. And so a lot of our work recently has been in solidarity with Palestine um, and the Palestine Project and developing workshops and decolonizing pedagogy around looking at the similarities um, and connections between people on Turtle Island and you know, across the ocean um, and what are some impacts of settler colonialism that can be um, analyzed here as well as there and specifically looking at the border and the environmental impacts of settler colonialism on the US-Mexico border and the Palestine-Israel border and developing curriculum around that as one way to um, build indigenous solidarity across continents and across lands um, to, to um, really think about ethnic studies and decolonizing pedagogy as an international approach. Um, it is internationalism and we have to, oftentimes in ethnic studies, we really have this like very narrow focus about the US and that we need to really be looking at, at the whole world and how these issues are impacting the entire globe, whether it's environmentally, energetically, you know, socially, economically, um, politically, in order to, to have a real analysis. Thank you, Anita. Um, I think this next question is going to help uh, a lot of the, the educators that are in the room right now, the, the administrators, educators, and the students um, that are listening in. How can schools value the cultural and community wealth that students bring with them? And I think this question also is, it comes from uh, Tarayoso's work, right? Who, who has created a framework of uh, community wealth, right? And the different forms of capital that students bring with them to the classroom. Um, what do you think schools can do to value those uh, cultural and community wealth that students bring with them? I think, I think the biggest one is just listening. Um, like actively listening, especially as educators, um, you know, I think like not, okay, an educator has a lot of knowledge, but they don't know everything because they, they didn't walk that walk of life that you walked, you know, um, and every student has that, a different walk of life and just like listening and really not just actively listening because sometimes you'll just never understand, but being able to just try to um, just be there and, and understand just see them for who they are, I think, is um, what really needs to happen in the classroom, just seeing people for who they are and all that they bring with them, you know? Thank you, Jasmine. Tyrell? I think um, a large piece, sorry, there's like a mosquito buzzing in my ear. <laughs> um, I think a large piece of what schools can do is to really seek out people who this is their life mission to figure out how to appreciate children, appreciate the cultural and community wealth that they bring with them. There are people who that's what they spend their whole lives thinking about. So reaching out to those folks as consultants to help create a strategic plan, create um, plans around curriculum about what does this look like to acknowledge students in this way because those folks who have these lived experiences around um, acknowledging community wealth like have likely transformed in their own lives I think to to be a de decolonial practitioner is something that you have to walk every day. It's not something to just be studied. It's not something to just take a class about. It's not something to just read a book about. It, it happens throughout the whole day. It happens in all the conversations that you're having. It, it's happening in all the ways that you're interacting with others. And so I think that schools really need to bring in more experts in this, people who are living really close to the land, people who have made those decisions to let go of certain colonial frameworks to you know, be in better community with each other, with other humans, to be in better community with the earth itself. And then also all the other stuff I said about the individual healing that has to happen. Thank you, Tyrell. Dr. Fernandez? 
Sure. Um, I would just add on um, totally agreeing with the expert piece, right? Like really thinking about whose knowledge we frame as legitimate knowledge in the school system and, um, and understand, and first of all, teachers understanding their own positionality and then also how that interacts with the community. And, and just like Tyrell is saying, you know, a lot of folks don't know their, the, own, the community that their students are coming from. They're not integrated and invested in that community necessarily. And so needing to have that understanding and bringing in folks who might not seem like quote unquote experts, but have incredible expertise, particularly centering those folks uh, with the intention of having the students see themselves as experts and hear their stories and about their culture and about um, everything that they that represents them right we should be centering um, the curriculum and the experts you know around the lives of our students uh, and I also think that um, in terms of community community cultural wealth I think we sometimes really latch on to a couple of the different forms of cultural wealth that Yoso writes about like um, linguistic wealth or um, you know, transformational um, wealth or, re or even resistance capital, but really thinking about the notion of um, navigational capital as key for a lot of our youth, uh, understanding how they navigate different spaces and places and um, when they go home or when they're at work or when they're at school and how they have to move in and out of these different uh, spaces and ways of speaking and ways of knowing and understanding that that in itself is such a form of knowledge and, and, and wealth that we could be building um, our school culture around rather than saying that you act this way and you speak this way in this setting and, and you act this way and speak this way in that setting, but to welcome that in to the, to the school space as well. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're coming down to about uh, the last the last question here, and um, this question is: What do you think are the impacts of a revolutionary and decolonized educational experience for students and educators? Jasmine, you want to jump in? Yeah, I think um, just the sense of belonging really um, really helps a student get through. Um, school because I remember well right now I'm, I'm struggling in college because I like I'm having to find that that new community of people that um that care um but it's a little harder because the two the teachers um I had I had that little crutch in high school when my teachers were there with me all three all four years and so like I got to like really get to know them um but I think um decolonizing classroom means a sense of belonging and that overall we we're social beings so we want to feel loved and we need to feel like we belong um, in order to thrive really so um, it helps with the motivation and wanting to learn and actually getting stuff done um, so I think it would it would really help with the graduation rates as well because the dropout rates are insane especially in Arizona right now yeah thank you Jasmine Tyra yeah, I think um, retention, kids staying in school is, is a huge piece of it, particularly if they're engaged with stuff that they can immediately apply to their lives, or they're engaged with things that, you know, they've heard about from their families. And they see people who look like them and sound like them, and they're learning about their, you know, their own history um, in a way that helps repair the attempted cultural genocide, the cultural practices that were stolen from them because they may not be growing up on their ancestral homelands. So I think that piece is huge. And then I think also eliminating the school to prison pipeline. And I think the, the literal school to prison pipeline of like people ending up in, in the prison industrial complex, but I also think about the school to corporate world pipeline or the school to only a specific type of job. I think that a, decol a, decol a decolonized and revolutionary education sp experience also really um, uplifts entrepreneurship and uplifts students being able to create from their own community, create from their own creativity and create family businesses so that their wealth, like their, their 
their specific wealth, like their financial wealth is theirs and they're able to start to build up generational wealth to pass on to children. And that can't happen, like someone said in the, in the comments, that can't happen working at an Amazon warehouse where your body is being physically exhausted and you're getting paid like an okay rate compared to some of the other jobs, but you're not really building wealth for yourself. Yeah, thank you. Anita? Sure. Um, I think that, you know, we've seen a lot of the results that, that can take place when there's a revolutionizing, revolutionary, whatever you want to call it, education, um, and somewhat decolonizing or re-indigenizing education like we had here in Tucson. You, you have all the, the measures that the state loves, you know, that increase um, graduation rates, matriculation to college, um, test scores, et cetera. But then we, you have all the unmeasured uh, pieces too that, that have been referred to here, right? That, that this kind of education builds self-love, that it builds opportunities and it opens doors for young people to take not only academic, but lifelong risks and are able to dream up a, a new possibility. Whereas um, when you have a traditional system that's a colonial system that's meant to only advance certain people in certain ways. Um, it, it's a very stagnant uh, sort of system and doesn't provide that opportunity for you to reimagine what's possible. Uh, I think that um, you know having historical literacy for young people with a decolonizing lens, it offers that opportunity and encourage that encourages them to have a critical praxis to then go out and try and make change for their own community and for their own people, as well as, uh, you know, building their academic identity, building that self-love, et cetera. And I would just say that in, in those spaces of decolonizing education, being a decolonial educator, you'll hear, especially right now, you know, that that, that, that is indoctrination and that you, sh you should remain neutral as a teacher or you should um, not share your opinions. And um, I believe really strongly that, that you know, that's a, a, a you know, it's not a two-sided issue. Like that's a false equivalency. And, and there's no neutral option in terms of decolonizing pedagogy. Like you're either decolonizing and, and teaching revolution in a revolutionary manner, or you're perpetuating the settler colonial project. Like there's no in between. You're either doing one or you're doing the other. And um, it's hard to imagine doing that in a, in a traditional public school space, uh, but that, that's what it takes. Thank you, Anita. We're gonna open it up for questions um, from, from the guests. I invite you to, to share any questions that you have in the chat. Um, I'm gonna jump in and share um, my perspective and, and just kind of like, do my best to also recognize and honor all the words that have been shared uh, tonight. Um, as a as a as a former high school educator, right, that spent a lot of years in the classroom, um, and also someone who experienced early on like the impact of zero tolerance policies. Uh, I, I I went to school in a public, I went to school in LAUSD schools, right, and. Um, um, it's very clear, right? The policing and the over uh, focus on security um, in these larger schools um, is uh, directly related to some of those policies that were put in place in the in the '90s. I'm teaching a class right now called Critical Youth Organizing and Transformation, and a lot of the work that youth were doing in the '90s was was started uh, because of the the zero tolerance policies that were locking up a lot of the young black and brown students in inner city schools. And so I, I come out of that experience of just like living that trauma, uh, making sure that you didn't say the wrong thing or you didn't, um, you know, you didn't, you weren't caught in the wrong place uh, because of, of those, uh, those draconian violent policies. Um, so I think I want, I'm sharing that because that's what motivated me to go into education and be a, a teacher. I had some pretty uh, impactful uh, social justice educators um, throughout my, my K through 12 educational experience. 
And they, they really were coming out of different uh, movements, coming out of the Chicano movement and civil rights movement. And they, they, were, they were conscious educators that were really uh, pushing uh, for, for some of, for BIPOC folks, for, for students of color like myself to move into higher education um, and to consider uh, higher education. So for me, um, I, was, I was really inspired to be a, to be a teacher and, and to continue um, supporting and pr promoting access to higher education. Because it's a big problem, right? Um, but I, what I found out in my, in my own um, educational experience as a, as a teacher, right, being in the classroom, is that the classroom was really confining. It was really difficult to get students to be in the classroom sitting down for 55 minutes or an hour. And what I began to introduce to my students was, was more of a land-based education and, and more, of a, more of an environmental science education from, through observations and working with plants outside and building gardens and paying attention to terrain and how water was flowing uh, on the school property. And that um, led to years of, of, a, of a restoration ecology project that started here on the K-20 Changemaker campus a few years ago, um, where we planted trees and we, we um, um, were harvesting rainwater, we're growing our, our own vegetables. And, um, and that, to me, I, I saw a lot of, um, uh, to me, that was decolonizing education because it was putting in practices that some of our antepasados were doing just a generation back. And by that, I'm referring to, um, we're, we're talking about uh, um, historical literacy and how do we teach history, right? Because um, I was a social studies teacher and, and my job was to teach history and, and the standards and the way the his, history, frame, the way history is taught in America, it's taught from the, Northeast, as opposed to teaching history from the South to the North, right? And many of our students, many of our Brown students, their history starts in the South. It starts in, in Mexico or Central America, and, and it's an indigenous history that is, um, is missing and often not um, the, the, the narrative is not the, the, the story that is being um, reclaimed or retold in, um, in schools, and so uh, for me, I, I spent a lot of time outside, um, and I saw that work to be very political, right? Because going back to what what Dr. Fernandez was saying, if we're not engaged in, in decolonizing an edu education, then someone is benefiting, right? That that the current establishment is benefiting from our students not getting a political education, not getting a decolonizing an edu education is is violence, right? Um, and, and our students deserve, right? They deserve to, to have a, 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 their stories, right, to be told. And they have a right, right, to, to heal from that historical trauma. And so I just wanted to share that um, before we, we take any questions uh, here in the chat. Uh, let, me, let me look at the chat here. And we have a question um, by Cheyenne. How do we transform the educational system or the education system rather than settle for reforms that replicate the previous oppressive structures? Does anybody want to jump in? And Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, I really appreciate you bringing that up, Cheyenne, because I when we talk about uh, reform movements in education, right, that's a that's a very specific um, charge and, and when we reform something it really still has all of those components all of those elements all of those colonial structures in the new whatever new way of, of being and doing school will be right it's like a ball of clay um, and you're just remolding it to look a little bit different but if you're just reforming something it's it's not the same as um you know you're saying um here transforming and I would go a step further to even say dismantling right we have to dismantle and then build back up from the bottom up to ensure that all of those structures that are in place that push our students out 
that cause trauma, that don't allow our students to heal, that don't allow students to see themselves, that those are not there as we start to build back up. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of, it's always about reform, reform, reform in education. And uh, from my perspective, you know, we need to be dismantling and, and building back. Thank you, Anita. Does anyone else want to address that question? Yeah, I can. <clears throat> um, I think I, I would like to address it in terms of imagining the dismantling. And so some of that could look like choosing where your children go to school in, a, in an alternative school system and um, building with other parents uh, a homeschooling system. <clears throat> um, I think that like schools like Changemakers, schools like Dream School, like we require a lot of community support to be able to thrive. We re require all the things, we require marketing, we require all the things that a business needs. Um, the Unified School District doesn't require Require all that same marketing because they're established. They're an established infrastructure. And so I think in any ways that people can, you know, promote, can send grants to, can do things that help to build up the infrastructure of alternative schools, um, then maybe there will be more distributed wealth between the different types of schools that up that cause you know some of the crumbling of the established school system thank you we have uh one other question here in the chat um and the question is from kai how do how do you see the role of decolonizing educational spaces and building and sustaining social movements Um, I feel like when you decolonize the classroom, you kind of, while you're humanizing your, like the, the students, they kind of get that little spark inside of them to feel like they can go out and do anything in the world. They have that like confidence and that love for themselves and love for others to do great things. And I think um, when you're giving them that, those resources to actually mobilize themselves in their community, um, I think that would have, like that has the greatest impact on social movements because you're you're essentially creating change makers for the world or like you're letting them see like what their passion is and how they can navigate in the world with what they're really good at because you helped like help them see that and you helped grow that um, as an educator while you decolonize the classroom because you're not making them little robots you're actually making them human beings to go outside and, and do something out there outside of the school and those four walls that you're teaching them in. Thank you, Jasmine. Would anyone else like to add? I can just add really briefly, Tyrell, unless you want to jump in. Good. Um, you know, just the importance of education as a whole in, in revolution, right? In, de in um, you know, movement building and in social movements and you know, just thinking about this moment that we're in right now, um, where there is an attack on so many things that are happening in schools, an attack on teaching accurate history, right? We have all of this legislation coming down the pipe that is literally trying to outlaw the teaching of an accurate history or the training of any, anything to do with quote unquote diversity or privilege or power and to trying to squelch that. Um, and in order to you know, to build movements and to build power, we actually, we absolutely have to have this kind of education so that our young people are ready to join those fronts. And so that we understand how these cycles of oppression repeat themselves, right? Like how is the past alive in the present just in the last 10 years, right? We're seeing it's the same folks doing the same pushing to remove these things from school. Um, and if you go back in history, you know, it just keeps repeating itself over and over again. And so as educators and as students, we need to have not only the historical literacy, but the organizing skills, the analysis, the critical consciousness to be able to understand how these cycles of oppression work, why they are, in, you know, why these uh, pieces of legislation and um, pushback, you know, where it's coming from and what the intention is, what the history is, 
and uh, decolonizing, decolonizing educational space provides that opportunity and the opportunity to practice on how to build these fronts together. Thank you, Anita. There is one, I think there's one question here by Dale. How to better support the decolonization of public schools? No, I think I think that's it. Well, I want to I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we're we're coming about uh, to the end of the hour, and um, thank you for for joining us uh, tonight. Um, just a just a pitch. Our um, this is our first uh, workshop series here at the Tucson Center. Um, our next one will will take place. October 8th at three o'clock, and we'll be focused on centering indigenous people and disrupting settler colonial narratives. Well, thank you all, and, and please stay tuned for our next, um, our next workshop series. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Tyrell. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Yay! Thank you. <laughs>